Afrique Média. Le monde, c'est nous. Hello to you, ladies and gentlemen. Thanks for joining us this day on this other edition of the program. It is views on the continent, of course. Uh, today we are discussing something very pertinent as uh, the uh, second uh, Russia-Africa summit is holding in uh, St. Petersburg today. We want to analyze uh, this uh, particular topic, looking at how uh, foreign uh, uh, countries uh, or foreign policies affect or influence the economic development of African uh, states. Uh, this is in particular to the relationship existing between uh, uh, the uh, Russia and the African continent. It should be noted that uh, President Vladimir Putin of Russia and some African uh, state or his African, uh, his African counterpart are meeting today uh, as the second Russia Africa summit uh, opens to discuss uh, um, issues of mutual uh, concern in the present global context. However, as the meet, we want to holistically look at how states' foreign policies affect uh, Africa's economies in uh, every sphere. It should be noted that the Russia-Africa summit has emerged as a significant uh, platform fostering closer ties between Russia and African nations with its vast resources and growing influence. Russia has actively pursued a foreign policy approach that aims to bolster economic development across the African continent. Through its multifaceted engagement, Russia's foreign policy has been instrumental in shaping and influencing the economic landscape of African states in this discussion, however, we will explore the key ways in which Russia's foreign policy initiatives will continue or have led to the positive advancement in economic development within various African countries by examining, of course, the strategic partnership, trade agreement, and investment activities. We will equally uncover the impact of Russia's involvement and shed light on the potential for further collaboration in the future. It should be noted that foreign policy in the areas of, uh, occur in the areas of aid and development, trade and investment, resource extraction, diplomatic relations and partnership, conflict and security, among others. However, in this edition of the program Views on the Continent, we seek to answer this question on how uh, these uh, foreign policies can be defined or designed and implementing, uh, implemented, I beg your pardon, considering local context, civil society, and long-term sustainability. Stay with us. This is Views on the Continent. Of course, it is views on the continent, and you are most welcome to this compelling program that can, uh, seeks to discuss issues of, uh, of uh, utmost importance that uh, you know. Uh, it is holding at the time of the Crusher, Russia Africa uh, Summit, the second of its kind, uh, where we see uh, the president or the leadership of Russia uh, gathering or meeting with his. African counterparts to discuss issues of mutual, uh, uh, mutual concern. And today we have heard in the preamble highlighting since the engagement of Russia in Africa, some uh, uh, improvements, especially in the economic uh, perspective, have been uh, uh, recorded. And we see how uh, this uh, ongoing Russia-Africa summit will continue to serve as a catalyst or a lead master for better uh, engagement cooperation between Russia and African continents in the present global context. I uh, uh, appreciate you for making out time to be with us. Time to unveil this uh, panel of experts, and I'm taking you straight away to St. Petersburg in uh, Russia. Let's uh, meet uh, this uh, uh, panel of experts. Uh, with uh, Now I want to introduce to you Yulia Berg. She's a political scientist and a uh, thank you for accepting to be with us this day, uh, dear Yulia, as we continue to analyze issues of utmost interest. Uh, hello, I'm happy to be a guest of yours once again. We're here at the venue, so um, uh, we are 
uh, all together on the same venue finally and this was uh, a moment that uh, many have been expecting since 2019 okay. so i'm um, happy to welcome um, the, all of the delegations and guests from uh, african countries here in russia and i think there is a lot to discuss and a lot to get done in the upcoming future Indeed, a lot to discuss con uh, constructively as far as the relationship between uh, Russia and uh, African, the African continent is uh, concerned. Let's also welcome Dr. Musawen Kosi uh, Mzuli, who is chairman of Co uh, Parker Medical and General Trade Limited. He's joining us uh, live from uh, St. Petersburg in Russia. Hello to you, Doctor. It's a pleasure welcoming you to Afrique Media for the first time. You're most welcome. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you. Uh, I'm happy to be part of the panel. Looking forward to participate in this uh, panel. Uh, we're having a very successful uh, forum in St. Petersburg. Mm -hmm. So far, everything is moving very well. Thank you very much. Thank you, too, for accepting to be with us uh, this day. And uh, let's uh, welcome Anna White Agbor. She is a development communication uh, a professional, but she is joining us uh, from, uh, the, uh, from Nigeria. Hello to you, uh, Anna White. It's a pleasure having you this day. Hello everyone, sorry I'm on the move. It's a pleasure to be here and I look forward to having further conversations um, on the subject of today. Okay, thank you so much. Thank for you. Your time. Hi. Yeah, thank you for your time uh, and white. And of course, uh, we will be joined shortly uh, by uh, Aowa Don Melo, who is a BRICS uh, representative for Western Central Africa. He will join us subsequently. And of course, let's acknowledge also uh, Igor Stol Stolvarov, who is head of Project Games of the Future. Uh, you're most welcome, sir. Um, thank you. Uh, yes, I'm here. I'm actually in the same room as the other people here. Uh, and uh, I'm also very honored to participate in the session. Just a small brief on what's happening on the side of strangely enough but anyways uh, uh yeah looking forward to the session but i will uh, write off with you uh mr igor of course russia demonstrates being up, uh, open for partnership only uh, not only in the economic perspective or sphere but also in the areas of sport you know uh, like in 2022 uh, the project games of the future was launched a vivid example of course of an in uh, innovative approach and use and the use of new technologies that is uh, now uh, as the head of the games of the future mr uh, igor Storov, uh, let's uh, of course you're joining to there and uh, at the same time that the russia africa summit is holding so let's let's talk on on this aspect uh, you mentioned that the this uh, uh, the the the, the uh, a file digital that is of course you're going to elaborate more on that and of course after this phenomenon has appeared recently and not everyone is conversant of course i for one not everyone is conversant with it so the question i'll be directing to you is uh, i know that the pilot competitions were already uh, held in the city of kazan so now how did it go and which countries participated Uh, we have uh, we have hosted uh, something like 40, 40 countries so because we've started the test comp test events uh, from September last year and if you combine them all it's almost 40 countries that already participated including African countries that I will speak a little bit more elaborate a little bit more on that but I'm also want to say that it, it's quite strange that we're we're starting from the soft power because we represent the soft power as we're sometimes called, as the sport and the culture are sometimes called. But anyways, I think this is a good sign uh, because we're starting from the sport. And um, Russia will host enormous amount of the international competition uh, next year. Um, uh, it's strange because uh, Russia has been a little bit isolated from uh, 
the Western part of the, as you know, because of the political situation and geopolitical situation and macroeconomic situation, there's a lot of things happening and we see right now this dramatic change in the landscape of the sport and the culture. And that is why athletes has to athlete, athletes have to participate in order to sustain their physical form and in order to to compete and in order to maintain their 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 physique and uh, and their statues. And that is why Russia has set up with lots of initiative and lots of new competitions of the new format. Some of them are very much traditional. Like, uh, for example, we've just seen on this presentation, there was a lot of people from the African countries that our friends from the Ministry of Sport has launched another initiative, which is called the Games of Friendship, which are happening in September in Moscow. That's one event. Another event that's going to be um, a um, uh, Games of BRICS countries that are happening in June in Kazan as well. Kazan um is this is a fabulous uh, uh city um the eastbound uh, from from moscow something like 1000 kilometers absolutely magnificent and i invite everybody who's listening to us to not to limit your experience in russia only by moscow and petersburg but actually visit kazan because this is absolutely enormous from from any perspective from sports perspective as well because this is closer to our heart as, as a as a big number of the sport uh, uh, sport uh, venues on which uh, you can actually organize any kind of sports but anyways you have um, games of BRICS countries you have games of friendship you have digital games or games of the future that we are organizing and i'm the leader of the project i have a a a, a big team was actually working for that which is we, we are actually the first because we're starting in february and uh, it's going to be 10 days of the competition and we're inviting um, we are trying to instill we're, we're trying to uh, pr proliferate we're trying to push the new philosophy and the new ideology in sport we're saying that first of all we don't want any political barriers we don't want any political bias uh, first of all secondly we're trying to combine technology and the conventional sport technology and the classical sport we're trying to combine the cyber sport which is purely 100% digital this is all over us we're being encompassed by this kind of sport but not everyone would feel it but anyways we're being already uh, encompassed as I said by this digital uh, atmosphere and the cyber sport is absolutely rampant uh, all over the world and we're trying to combine cyber sport experience together with the classical sport experience together with the conventional sport. And this is what we do. This is called a digital uh, philosophy in sport. And we're also doing some technologically advanced sports like um, battle of uh, robots or drone racing or sport programming and, and, and things like that. So we're trying to, to showcase three pillars. One is a cyber sport, another digital sport and technological advanced or, or sport, which would require some gadgets to uh, increase your power or or speed or whatever. So we're trying to, one of the slogans that we use, we're bridging humanity and technology. So this is what we do. But anyways, I think sport is a good mean to, uh, to bring the nations together. Uh, I'm saying very banal things, very commercial things, but anyways, I think this is this is very much true. I think we're trying to come up to set up the new sport equity which actually doesn't have this political bias like some of the western sport equity would have towards russia and towards some other countries we're trying to actually unite nations uh, and we're trying to get to the roots of what sport has been invented to be in the i don't know 100 years or 150 years our modern sport as we as we as we know it right now has been invented to actually unite nation and not to disintegrate nations and this is what we do and we are very much welcome to well we are very much honored to welcome uh, african countries also to participate in our test events to participate in the games of the future to send the delegations and uh, we would be as i said honored accommodate uh them all to show the real hospitality of russia to show the, the beauty of Kazan, and not only Kazan, but Moscow and St. Petersburg and all over Russia, 
and then to um, we're looking forward to uh, to host uh, these events for a transparent and just and uh, and uh, really sports competition. Thank you so much, Mr. Ingo. Talking about uh, people uh, joining or participating in uh, this uh, event, uh, now uh, uh, what are some of the, the principles on which teams uh, participate in the games of the future? What are the guiding principles? Uh, we are, we're selecting the teams. We're selecting the, the teams uh, on, the, on the different, what we call the different funnels. The main of the main funnel that we use is that we're doing a picks like according to the ratings, because all the cyber sport and the digital teams would have a world, uh, no, a world recognized ratings, and we are actually inviting the teams as per. Their, their their position in the ratings because we want the this tournament to be really top notch and we want uh, the biggest amount of the technical reach from the media perspective we want views we want traffic we want watchers uh, of, of our event that's why we are basically picking up the teams from what we call a direct invitation but also we are doing this is funnel number one this is the main funnel but we're also doing the do, doing it through the we're also picking up the team. We're selecting the team through the federations, uh, cyber sport federations that I that are existing in in some of the countries. Not in all of the countries, cyber sport federations exist per se, or even physical federations. Uh, we're also uh, using the help of the associations or our vendors that are providing the technical services for 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 some of the competitions, uh, and this is what we do. But anyways, we are actually inviting clubs, not the uh, not the national teams, but actually the clubs would anyways belong to uh, belong to some jurisdiction, belongs to some uh, geography or to some to some country. Uh, we uh, our targets is to have more than a hundred uh, nations participating in our event in our games of the future. But as I said, we're already having like a forty. And we've sent the invitations to another 30. So overall, we're standing in the number of our current total is something like 70, 70 countries, including uh, the, 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 the predominant majority of the African countries. We've sent the invitations to them, not to all in all of the disciplines, because in, the, in, in, in not in all of the disciplines, the African countries may compete on a world class level, but definitely in football, definitely in basketball, definitely in the MMA. There's some African countries that are absolutely um, in the in the in the top ten or top hundred uh, world class nations uh, in in some of the disciplines, and uh, as I said, yeah, I mean they're very much welcome to participate either in test events and also in the games of the future in February next year. Head of the uh, pro Project oh, Games of the Future, thank you for the insight and of course uh, it will be uh, a, a good uh, 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 element that will uh, uh, further solidify uh, the partnership or cooperation between countries, between Russia and uh, other countries. Thank you. We are going to continue with the uh, analysis of today uh, on how states' foreign policies affect or influence uh, economic development of African states. Uh, we uh, kick off with you, uh, dear Yulia. You know, this is a topic uh, uh, that has actually been uh, uh, on the debate topic uh, across Africa and of course uh, coming at a time of uh, uh, global geopolitics of where ge global geopolitics have actually seen an an increase so now taking uh, the Russia Africa summit which just started uh, today there in uh, uh, St Petersburg uh, in your own perspective uh, how, what does this summit seek to present to Africa as far as Russia's foreign policy is concerned? And of course, how has uh, Russia's foreign policy approach uh, towards African countries elevated or evolved over the years? Well, you see, uh, one of the key differences that is not always easy to notice or um, get used to in terms of the um, 
uh, foreign policy that Russian, the Russian Federation promotes and the one that the uh, Soviet Union was promoting is that uh, neither Russia nor the Soviet Union in, in that period of time were ever interested in Africa's mineral resources. And the reason for that is that uh, Russia is quite rich in resources uh, by itself, right? So there is no need to uh, to apply those, uh, you know, neo-colonial or colonial um, approaches when uh, uh, cooperation cannot be mutually beneficial in the first place, right? So um, uh, when um, you know the um, uh, the potential uh, joint projects are being discussed, uh, of course, uh, both sides have uh, a lot to exchange, right? Um, and uh, uh, here at the forum, it's becoming more and more clear that only uh, um, an equal partnership uh, can lead both parties to uh, a, a balanced, uh, sustainable, and uh, beneficial economic uh, models of uh, cooperation. Uh, because, well, um, uh, it's uh, not a secret and there is nothing to hide in it that, you know, the uh, uh, many of the um, international financial institutions are uh, not in the hands or not being controlled either by Russia nor by African countries. And the same thing can be observed in terms of simple uh, financial and payment systems, right? So uh, when we combine the uh, efforts and put our efforts together, we uh, might be able um, or uh, we will hopefully uh, succeed, but only if that is um, an equal partnership and only if those are uh, joint ventures. I don't know what uh, my colleagues would uh, have to say on this one, but my take is definitely that uh, there is a need to join the efforts and uh, work on the basis of um, joint projects and um, uh, you know joint uh, ventures in order to ensure mutually beneficial development and trade uh, and to balance up the um, the existing uh, status quo. Thank you very much. Uh, I'll continue with uh, the ladies. Uh, let's go now to uh, Nigeria. We're meeting Anna White, a uh, development communication uh, professional. Of course, we are today looking at how per, uh, foreign policies of states can uh, enhance or influence the development, economic development of African states. As uh, an uh, uh, economic professional or development professional uh, and a white, so what is your perspective as far as uh, the relationship between uh, the Russian Federation and the African continent is concerned? And of course, where are the areas uh, that can be actually highlighted as far as Russia's foreign policy is concerned while dealing with Africa? Please, can you open your mic so we can hear you, please? I think we are going to proceed uh, to the next uh, speaker. If we cannot get through. Hello, Anna. Unfortunately, I uh, cannot uh, uh, get you well. Let's continue with Dr. Musa Wankozi. Of course, we are looking at uh, the influence of uh, uh, foreign uh, uh, policy, or state's foreign uh, policy on Africa and how this impact uh, the African continent. Like the preamble, Doctor, we underlined the aspect of uh, foreign aid, security, investment, foreign direct investment, and, and others as aspect of uh, uh, foreign policies of nation. Today, you are actually partaking in uh, the uh, second Russia-Africa uh, summit. And of course, if we are talking about in, uh, uh, international cooperation, it is how countries can come together and of course correlate for the benefit of all. So in your own perspective, what are those uh, specific economic sectors that uh, Russia and African countries can collaborate on and, and how uh, this uh, partnership or the partnership between uh, Russia and Africa affect local economies in Africa as, uh, of course, we continue to look at the, the relationship between uh, Russia and the African continent. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. 
uh, I would like to say that if foreign policy affects uh, countries in two ways. Uh, previous speaker spoke uh, about sport, and also it affects foreign policies, also affects in economic development. So uh, foreign policies have effect in two ways. They can affect our sportive uh, relationship and also economic relationship. Uh, what we have seen now in, in the world, the world is changing, uh, and the countries are independent countries, and the superpowers must assert that, that even African countries were independent countries. We don't believe that other uh, developed nations or other nations must influence us who we can deal with. They are trying to impose their foreign policies on developing countries like Africa. So that is not right. I think that we are independent states. We have the right to choose who we can do business and who we can uh, also do sport. It's uh, amazing that uh, African countries have taken this uh, uh, forum here in St. Petersburg. Uh, I'm part of the delegation, and uh, we are having a, a lot of heads of states of African countries and also uh, ministers, uh, business people from African states. They never listen to the pressure that they don't go to Russia, don't, go, don't do business with Russia. So that's what we have been hearing, that uh, we should not uh, actually have anything to do with Russia, both economic and uh, sporting uh, in the sporting field. But uh, what is interesting, what we are seeing in St. Petersburg is that uh, most African countries, they never been to that. We have a, a good number of uh, heads of states attending and, and business people and ministers. In terms of uh, foreign policies, I think uh, countries are, have a right to self-determination who they can do business uh, with. They don't have to, Western countries or big powers should not exact any uh, influence on decision who to do business with. What I want to say is that uh, the success of uh, St. Petersburg, uh, because day one it definitely was a big success, and I'm sure even tomorrow was a big success. This is sending a signal that we are in Africa, we are also an independent country. And also, uh, we should not forget that uh, during the liberation uh, times of African states, Russia was on the side of uh, African countries. Um, I'm from South Africa. I, I took part in the liberation struggle of uh, South Africa. So our partner was uh, Russia, and not only in South Africa, a lot of countries were supported by Russia, including Zimbabwe, Namibia, a lot of countries during the liberation struggle. So the foreign policies, I don't think we should affect us in Africa because we have a historical relationship with the, uh, Russia, which we want to develop and then move forward. Uh, what I want to add also is the influence of uh, foreign policy on sport. Uh, previous speaker here in the, in, in the panel has uh, stated that uh, you know sport can unite people and they are planning to have a lot of sporting activities in Russia that they are going to invite African countries and other countries of the world to participate. Uh, I'm a sports person. I run a sports academy in South Africa in Devon. In my sports academy, we have golf and uh, soccer. Uh, we are going to participate at... Uh, President Putin spoke about the university games that are going to take place at uh, Yekaterinburg. I'm sending my team also to come and participate. So what we need to do uh, as African countries is not to, to listen to any influence and not to participate in any kind of sport. Sport actually can use it to unite uh, African states, to unite the world, to unite all nations. So foreign policy on sport is affecting a, a sport in many ways. We, are, we have come also uh, with a, a very good proposal to start a BRICS soccer league where we are going to have two top teams in from the British countries participating in this uh, soccer league and then uh, invite about four or six other, other nations to be part of uh, this BRICS soccer league. The BRICS soccer league will start sometimes this year. So I think uh, moving forward, uh, we should not uh, allow foreign policies to affect our relationship in sports and in business. Thank you very much.
for that uh, doctor. Of course, uh, uh, the foreign policy should not in, uh, impede the steady growth of uh, sport or business, uh, especially across Africa. And of course, uh, coming back to you, uh, dear Yulia, still on this uh, same uh, perspective, you know, earlier today, while the, the president of the Russian Federation was meeting with his uh, African uh, counterpart uh, as uh, we opened uh, the second Russia-Africa summit, you know, the world is actually expecting and was expecting to hear uh, uh, President Putin's perspective regarding the Green Deal and also uh, the uh, Wagner Group uh, that uh, a lot of controversies have occurred uh, in recent times. Eh? So uh, in your own opinion, uh, and of course we saw that the leadership of Russia uh, actually made uh, promises of uh, of free grains to, to, to the African continent. So the question I want us to, to analyze at this juncture, you know, uh, promises have been made. And of course, we want to look at how soon uh, these uh, promises will actually be materialized to make it different uh, from uh, the existing promises that have always been made to African countries. We know that uh, with the advent of the Russia-Ukraine war, a lot occurred and of course economics were affected especially in Africa and we know that the Green Deal actually is a whole lot of it. So with this and of course the promises of uh, President Putin early on, what can you say and how uh, uh, feasible can this materialize or how possible or how soon? Well, you see, um, talking about uh, President Putin's uh, promises, uh, normally uh, promises made are the promises kept in his case. But unfortunately, Russia itself has been faced in situations when the uh, Green Deal um, initiate, initiative was, uh, generally speaking, sabotaged, right? And uh, quite a significant um, amount of time today at the forum was definitely dedicated to the Green Deal itself. And quite a lot was being said by uh, President Putin in his uh, address to the representatives of uh, uh, the African nations present at the Russia-Africa Forum and uh, not present, uh, you know, in these uh, polls, but um, actively, um, you know, listening to uh, the news on what's um, happening here in St. Petersburg. So uh, he elaborated on uh, this in quite a lot of details explaining um, you know, what uh, was being done and what is planned, also giving stats on uh, the grain that was supposed to reach uh, the African shores and the amounts that have actually um, uh, reached uh, the continent. So, unfortunately, um, we have been observing a situation where uh, the promises, not even promises, but the agreements uh, that were a part of the grain deal were not really followed by the ones we used to call partners. And um, uh, from, uh, you know, if, well, several, several days ago, the Green Deal was uh, at least paused, paused or maybe even frozen, uh, specifically due to the fact that uh, Russia couldn't keep its promises and couldn't deliver uh, to the full extent uh, due to this uh, sabotage that was being observed for, uh, you know, quite a long period of time. And there were many chances to fix the, the situation, which unfortunately was not really done. So now we see that uh, a lot of the existing arrangements, agreements, and even when we talk about the legal framework, a lot of it uh, requires at least a uh, revision or maybe reforms or maybe even creation of, uh, you know, alternative systems. That's why here um, we have gathered to uh, talk directly and to, um, you know, use this uh, venue right now in order to um, uh, agree on how those promises can be kept and how that can be delivered, given the fact that some of the uh, partners are the ones that cannot be trusted to the full extent as they uh, used to be. Uh, staying with you, dear Yulia, talking about the, the Green Deal, talking about the promises to the African uh, countries. Now, let's look at uh, with uh, with the current uh, uh, context. Uh, uh, we see the the sanctions uh, that have been meted on uh, Russia by uh, other parts, which have actually uh, uh, 
impeded uh, the, the steady uh, uh, flow of, of goods and of course uh, uh, bringing a, 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 a sort of way uh, on how Russia and other countries actually uh, cooperate. And today we are looking at foreign policies. So now, how can, uh, let, let's put it in, in this perspective, we're looking at how other decisions by other parts is actually in trying to, to probably uh, uh, put sanctions on Russia, they're indirectly uh, actually affecting uh, the uh, economies of African uh, uh, countries. And of course, how can this be solved? And of course, uh, knowing uh, that there is actually uh, a new uh, perspective across the Africa as far as global politics is concerned. So how can uh, these sanctions, uh, which have been placed directly on Russia, but uplifted because of uh, the uh, indirect uh, or the indirect or direct consequences on African economics? Well, uh, yes, um, a lot of countries have been facing uh, not just pressure uh, coming from, um, uh, you know, the West and uh, I mean, African countries that are uh, still trading with Russia or increasing trade, trying to increase trade and cooperation, uh, but also risks uh, of um, uh, uh, secondary sanctions. And this has been an issue, especially for the ones uh, dealing with uh, transactions because of a lot of banks, a lot of financial systems were affected um, by the sanctions. And uh, what is necessary to understand if there is the uh, demand and if there is the, uh, you know, uh, uh, the necessary foundations for um, the trade, it will be happening anyway, because business is just like water, you know, it flows and it finds its way even through some, you know, complicated landscapes. So uh, uh, this um, cannot be stopped completely, but uh, in many cases, it simply uh, leads to uh, increased uh, costs of those uh, transactions. And this is something to focus on. A lot of statements were being made, but aside for same statements, uh, there are quite a lot of alternative um, transaction and payment systems that, has, that have been worked on for several years by now. So uh, um, a lot of actors, um, including the ones present here in St. Petersburg at the Russia-Africa Summit venue, uh, they are looking forward to some of the announcements that are highly likely to take place um, at the end of uh, August, uh, already next month, uh, during the BRICS Summit that will be held in South Africa. So uh, there is quite a lot of work that was done. Uh, there is quite a lot of, um, quite a lot of alternative ways that were found, but the increased costs of financial transactions are definitely uh, killing some of the trade um, at the moment. Uh, yet, uh, uh, it seems to be more of a uh, technical on the one hand and political on the other hand uh, issue. And uh, the hopes are high that uh, it is possible to still overcome this problem possible to overcome uh, the uh, uh, setbacks or challenges. Uh, coming back to you, uh, Dr. Mdoli, uh, we are talking about the foreign policy here, and of course, uh, in the aspect of uh, trade and investment, uh, uh, you know, uh, looking at the Russia-Africa Summit and looking at the ties between the Russia Federation and African countries, of course, we know the place of uh, South Africa when it comes to the economic buoyancy of African states. My question now is, how can we foster foreign direct investment, uh, putting uh, together the ties, the existing ties between Russia and Africa? How can this be a, 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 a litmus test towards fostering foreign direct investment in Africa? And what implications can this have on uh, the economic uh, growth, especially as far as uh, the uh, uh, materialization of the African continental uh, free trade area is. Uh, I think the first thing that we need to do to develop trade between Russia and African states is not to, to listen to these negative foreign policies from the Western countries. I think this is the first step because, uh, you know, the Western countries are putting pressure on some of, of the African countries not to do business with uh, Russia. 
we should not loosen this to those foreign po uh, policies uh, because that will not help us to develop our economy to develop relationship with Russia. So the first step, I think uh, we must do that. And then the second step is uh, very important, what we are trying to do here. Uh, we have been having meeting with Russian uh, business people who are encouraging them to come to Africa. They mustn't listen to this negative. Remember, Russia and Africa were victims of uh, negative publicity, negative uh, fake news that Africa is not safe. Africa is not very powerful in Africa. It's not true. So what we are trying to do during this summit, we are encouraging Russian business people to feel safe when they come to Africa. Africa is also a very rich uh, continent with all minerals, and in Africa it's safe. So Western media continues to tell the business people around the world that Africa is not safe and it's discouraging everybody to come to Africa. So the, I hope after this uh, summit that the two things will happen. First, we're not going to listen to this pressure from Western countries that we should not do business with uh, Russia. That's a uh, wrong foreign policy. We are independent countries. We have a right to choose who we do business with. And secondly, we're encouraging Russian business people. There are a lot of Russian business people who are coming to Africa. Even before sanctions, actually I saw that in South Africa, even before sanctions, a lot of Russian business people are actually coming and investing. They are doing business in, in, in South Africa. So what I want to see after this uh, uh, conference is that uh, the attitude towards Africa must change among the uh, Russian business people. Most of them, their, their attitude is good, uh, but we want to encourage them to come to Africa and not listen to the Western media, which is discouraging them. And then secondly, the foreign policies uh, that are saying from the Western countries, that is saying don't do business with Russia, we must not listen to that. We are independent countries of Africa, we can do business even with Western countries, even with Russia, or anywhere. We have a right as independent states to do business with anybody. Thank you. Talking about the right as an uh, independent state uh, to do business with anyone, it is true that uh, in recent times we have witnessed a rise in multilateralism. We have witnessed uh, past showing country uh, interest uh, in uh, having uh, deals across Africa and also it's the time for Africa to make uh, uh, or stakeholders across Africa to make decisions uh, that will not actually mar uh, the uh, economic development of the country. We know the African Union Agenda 2063 and other development agendas are on the way. And of course, through uh, economic cooperation uh, with nations, uh, uh, we can go a long way uh, to meet uh, the objectives of this. Uh, let me stay with you, uh, Doctor, uh, talking about uh, uh, people who are actually calling on uh, African countries not to do business uh, with uh, Russia and of course uh, uh, that is uh, the, the game uh, that is ongoing across Africa but then there is need to make uh, the difference and that's why we are here uh, today on African media to discuss constructively and of course see now Knowing that uh, Russia uh, presents a fatal ground or Russia is a fatal partner for uh, a business, so how can uh, a business uh, be diversified, of course, uh, between the Rus uh, Russia and Africa, moving it uh, from uh, the traditional traditional sectors. We're looking at areas where this cooperation uh, between Russia and Africa can diversify to make the impact felt in Africa, especially positively. There is need, of course, for diversification. In your own perspective, how can this be done practically? You know, there are a lot of business sectors uh, which uh, I think most African countries were not aware that Russia is really developed. Uh, I had a very good meeting today with Rosatom. Uh, this uh, Russian uh, nuclear medicine company, they produce, I'm a medical doctor by profession. And what I, I learned today, uh, Rosatom is actually developing new methods of treating cancer. Uh, they, they are using a gamma uh, therapy and a, a lot of new technology that can come out from uh, 
uh, Russia. Remember, also now in South in Africa, in general, cancer is becoming a serious problem, uh, and the, the developments of those atoms can uh, definitely help us to develop. And another sector which uh, also today I managed to discuss with some Russian business people is uh, the, the cleaning of water. Uh, you know, water uh, is very important for life. Uh, in Africa, we have a problem of uh, clean water. I've seen a very interesting technology around here to clean water. It's a very uh, modern technology. So there are lots of areas, even the area of energy, uh, electricity, uh, a lot of energy sector. So there are three sectors that I think we can uh, diversify and develop with Russia. I think it's uh, energy, medicine, and also water treatment technology which are, I'm amazed I've met about the two can, companies that are, are doing a, a water treatment on a small scale and the other company is doing it on a larger scale. Remember, we have uh, issues of cholera outbreaks in Africa. Uh, one of the reasons of uh, cholera outbreaks is uh, water that is not clean. So we can work uh, with Russia also in, in that area. But moving forward, I think that there are a lot of areas that I can mention up, up to 10 areas which I see we can develop uh, with Russia in the sphere also of agriculture. I've seen some agricultural machines around here in, uh, in this uh, forum uh, in St. Petersburg, interesting agriculture uh, uh, trucks that are produced in Russia. So there are a lot of things which we can do with Russia moving forward. Thank you so much. Uh, just to remind those of you just tuning in, that uh, you are watching Views on the Continent on the Pan-African Television Africa Media. And today, we are focusing on the aspect of foreign policy and how well these uh, foreign policies uh, is actually helping in the advancement of uh, the economies of African states. We want to focus more on the economic development of African uh, countries. And uh, today we are talking in the perspective of the Russia-Africa Summit, uh, which is holding uh, in uh, St. Petersburg as uh, stakeholders, uh, civil society businesses continue to brainstorm and talk constructively on how they can foster uh, this uh, relationship. Uh, coming back uh, to uh, get your perspective on this topic, uh, dear Yulia, earlier on you highlighted the misinformation uh, that is actually uh, ongoing uh, regarding the involvement of Russia in Africa. And of course, I'll always underline uh, that uh, there is uh, what we call a communication war and propaganda that has actually painted a different image of Russia uh, Russia's present in Africa, but of course today we continue uh, to analyze uh, uh, this particular aspect earlier on, dear Yulia, you mentioned it, but now this question, you know, with all that is happening, the, that is being seen on social media and other websites uh, regarding uh, the involvement of Russia, which some people see as negative now, critics on their part see uh, Russia's uh, involvement in Africa's, especially Africa's extractive industry primarily uh, uh, to be beneficial to the Russian companies rather than uh, the contributing to the sustainable economic development. How would you respond to this claim? Uh, it is true that uh, the, uh, the, the war led to the most layer process and there is the uh, geopolitical component to this obviously the uh, hotspots uh, on the ground um, and obviously uh, some of the uh, informational wars taking place right now. Uh, given the fact that uh, the dominance in the uh, communication and media field definitely does not belong neither again to Russia nor to Africa, there's quite a lot of uh, misinformation that uh, is being spread and it was being spread for quite a while by now. And uh, it would also be true to say that uh, um, Russia's uh, media policy has not been proactive enough uh, and 
on the one hand, uh, you don't need to um, explore yourself and uh, you don't need to come up with excuses when you're sure about your position and what you're doing and when you deliver um, what you promise um, and try to be, um, you know, quite uh, persistent in what you do. Uh, yet at the same time, uh, lack of information uh, creates this uh, vacuum that uh, allows to speculate, manipulate, uh, and uh, um, yes, well, basically manipulate the public opinion. And we see the consequences of this um, pretty much uh, all over the place. So um, today over here, uh, in the framework of the uh, Russia-Africa summit, quite a lot of uh, work was focused on uh, communication and uh, there were quite a lot of uh, uh, journalists and media people present uh, at the uh, uh, working the situation uh, would be uh, changing with the time. I, I think there was some technical issue, right? So uh, <laughs> um, I hope you can still hear me well, but the point that I was making is that, uh, um, uh, you know, Russian and African specialists, even at this venue, they're working together in order to find uh, the optimal ways to exchange and disseminate uh, information. Um, across the continent and, you know, across Russia. Of course, there is the language barrier uh, that is uh, quite a significant challenge. Uh, yet at the same time, uh, there are always ways to uh, communicate and there are always ways to uh, disseminate the information from the ground that reflects the actual, the actual situation much better. And uh, I think, uh, you know, as the uh, time goes by, uh, we will see more and more of collaborations uh, between media people and people related to uh, movie and film industry and um, this kind of thing. So uh, quite a lot of work is being done in these days in, in St. Petersburg in order to create those venues, those uh, channels, and those opportunities to, uh, to you know, fight in this uh, information war on the same uh, side. <laughs> uh very important and of course uh, just mentioned uh, that uh, Africa Media is live uh, at uh, St. Petersburg uh, to actually cover and see uh, for itself uh, the how uh, the summit is ongoing so that uh, they can bring uh, to the global world first-hand information regarding uh, the engagement between Russia and the African continent of course it's a great milestone towards uh, solving this problem of misinformation uh, and propaganda in present uh, the context. But now, Rush, uh, Yulia, as you've made mention, of course, it is now the time for Russia to make it different. We know we are in the, already in the fourth industrial revolution. So how can uh, the Russian Federation direct or uh, uh, its uh, uh, foreign policy towards encouraging industrialization, which is what Africa needs presently. If Africa needs to be really involved, especially in uh, the uh, extraction and production of uh, the uh, minerals across the continent, there is need for this technology and which comes also with uh, uh, an industrial drive. So. How can this partnership or Russia's foreign policy be more geared towards promoting industrialization across African countries? Well, there are two uh, brief points that I would like to make on this one. Uh, number one is that uh, for quite a while, many African countries had to uh, be selling their raw materials or mineral resources, and then the uh, the benefits of those were being used by other parties, right? Uh, so at the moment, one of the goals that many countries set, and uh, this was very clear just recently at the uh, beginning of this month when I was uh, visiting uh, six uh, countries of the uh, continent, is that um, um, the production has to be focused and uh, localized uh, 
uh, on the continent in order to uh, provide the uh, added value and sell goods instead of or products instead of se selling uh, raw material, right? Uh, yet at the same time, in order to make sure that industrialization uh, is actually implemented and new facilities, factories, uh, uh, manufacturers um, are being built, uh, what is needed is the basic infrastructure. And by this, uh, in the first place, I mean energy and electricity. And uh, this, the second uh, important ingredient in this uh, is um, infrastructure for logistics. Because this is how the, uh, uh, the trade can be insured within the continent, and this is how uh, a foreign trade uh, can be insured. So um, it's um, not, an easy, um, not an easy process to go through, and uh, what is needed in the first place is um, uh, energy capacities in order to uh, ensure the, uh, the needs and demands of production. That's number one. Number two is uh, technology. And um, there is no need, as we say, to uh, invent the uh, bicycle once again. There is the Russian technology. There is cooperation within BRICS with partners from India and China uh, that can also provide quite a lot of uh, technology uh, and uh, quite a lot of equipment. Uh, and um, yes, there is the uh, logistics. So uh, creation of this kind of uh, joint uh, ventures and uh, um, intro introduction of new facilities and new uh, factories that would help uh, trade at a different level, not by selling raw material, but by selling uh, goods and products uh, to the very same, let's say, uh, uh, Western countries or anybody else. I mean, it's an open, uh, it's an open uh, global market, and this is um, exactly how it has to uh, function. Uh, within the framework of the polycentric or multilateral, um, you know, uh, framework. So I think that's the uh, solution. And uh, African uh, countries do not have much time to waste uh, because, uh, you know, there is uh, a lot of work that needs to be done. And again, even to ensure the uh, necessary energy or electricity capacities, you know, those are not uh, simple projects that are implemented in a few months. It might take up, uh, you know, years in order to uh, design uh, and build and uh, implement uh, this new energy infrastructure, logistical um, infrastructure. But the good news is that the modern technology allows to uh, to do it much faster. And I mean. The previous time I visited some of the countries like uh, Zimbabwe and Zambia was before the pandemic back in 2019. And uh, after um, having visited this year uh, uh, in 2023, so just four years um, later, um, I was very much uh, positively surprised by uh, the amount of uh, infrastructure built in those pandemic years, again, in Zambia or Zimbabwe, for instance, airports, roads, uh, and quite a lot of uh, different facilities that appeared uh, almost in no time. So, um, uh, yes, there is a lot to uh, get done, and there have to be some complex, uh, holistic approaches being used. Uh, but uh, moving towards that direction would lead to the desired results for sure. Okay, thank you for that, uh, dear Yulia. Uh, coming back to you, Dr. Mpuli, uh, we are talking about Africa's perspective here. Uh, we are focused on how uh, the uh, partnership uh, between Africa and Russia and even other countries can actually favor the African continent. And that's why we are on the aspect of foreign policies. If foreign policies are favorable, of course, that will help uh, uh, to bolster uh, development in every sphere across Africa. And we are also conversant of the fact that with foreign policy, there is uh, uh, actually a, a constructive diplomatic relationship and a partnership between countries. Coming back to you, looking at, of course, you're coming from South Africa, and we know that uh, recently uh, South Africa has actually been under a serious attack for having backed uh, uh, Russia uh, stance as far as the, the Russia-Ukraine war is uh, a concern, and of of course, we see even critics uh, the, the saying uh, that uh, uh, South Africa actually has uh, nothing to offer rather than attend BRICS uh, meetings. But now, 
to make a difference. How can uh, the partnership with uh, Russia and other BRICS uh, nations actually portray to the world that, of course, the solution, especially the, the financial solution of Africa lies between the diplomatic ties with BRICS nation. We know if uh, there is one thing that is impeding the steady re recovery and growth of the African continent is the lack of financial independence. And we know that the African continent has always been sidelined from the financial market. And we can see that today. And that's why we, we last time we were discussing on how we can actually curtail Western hegemony and of course uh, bring African uh, countries into the financial marketing of course. So now in this perspective, we are looking at how Russia and other uh, BRICS nation can uh, bolster this diplomatic relationship that they have with Africa to be able to have, uh, help the African continent, you know, is exchange of expertise, resources, knowledge. When people get together, they get to learn. And of course, how they collaborate will help in the transformation of countries. So how can this diplomatic relationship between uh, the Russia and other BRICS nations and uh, the continent Africa help to bring resolve to this very important aspect of the continent, which is the quest to having financial independence? I think uh, BRICS countries are taking uh, Africa also. Uh, there was a plenary recession you know, where President Putin was also speaking, and we saw former uh, president of Brazil, Delma. She's now the head of the BRICS Bank. She was present in this uh, plenary recession, which shows that uh, the BRICS nations are taking relationship with Africa very, very serious. Uh, I think uh, Africa and BRICS nations should come together and work together to develop uh, each other. We need each other for trade development. Uh, going back to the issue of uh, foreign policy, uh, especially concerning my country, which you just asked, uh, South Africa, uh, I, I think as we are reminding people that we are an independent country, uh, we can do business with anybody we like. And also people should not forget and we have a historical relationship with the Russia. Uh, Russia was there during uh, dark days when we were fighting apartheid. Russia was uh, helping us uh, until we got our independence in 1994. So we have a historical relationship uh, with Russia, which dates back uh, years, years back. Uh, they've been on the side of uh, the oppressed uh, black majority of South Africa. Russia was always there with us. So we cannot listen to anybody uh, to say don't do anything, don't have any relationship with Russia. We've got a historical relationship, not only with South Africa. Russia helped a lot of African countries uh, during the liberation struggle. I, I think a foreign policy, you know, I like your topic because you know, the, your topic of foreign policy is very key here. It's affecting relationship between countries. So this, uh, we, we must never, never uh, listen to negative uh, foreign policies. They must uh, affect our relationship with any country. I always remind people that Africa is a, a continent with independent countries, which they have a right to do business with France. African countries have a right to business with the USA, have a right to do business with Russia, Germany, and everywhere. So people must respect the independence of African countries. They impose their foreign policies to African countries. That's why I'm so happy that uh, a lot of African countries have attended uh, the summit here in St. Petersburg, which showed our independence. There was pressure to don't go to St. Petersburg. There was pressure on the, uh, most of African countries not to attend. But fortunately, African heads of states, majority are here. Business people are here. Ministers are here. Uh, yesterday, I, I was uh, invited by the delegation of uh, Zimbabwe. Uh, we had the foreign minister of Zimbabwe uh, in that meeting yesterday. And a lot of ministers uh, are around, not only Zimbabwe, but from different African countries. Uh, also, uh, I'd like to mention the very important uh, uh, issue that was mentioned by Yulia of the media. You know, the media also is affecting, you know, the fake news, the problem. Uh, 
So media also has to be blamed, yeah, and they're spread, spreading these uh, wrong foreign policies and trying to affect uh, also the relationship between nations. So media, we must be very, very careful of uh, media. And I would like to thank African media that you are also covering uh, uh, this summit, which is a very important summit for African states. Uh, we look forward uh, to have a positive news coming from your side. Thank you very much. Uh, Lee, I will stay with you uh, talking about uh, uh, positive news coming from this end. Of course, the rest assured that Afric Media is all about uh, professionalism, objectivity, and of course, uh, uh, the wind of change is blowing across Africa, and it's the quest for uh, the, uh, China to ensure that Africa takes the, the position. Now, uh, we are talking about these ties, we're talking about foreign policies that can influence economic buoyancy or development of African states, uh, Dr. Really, now we know across Africa there has been this urge for uh, to promote entrepreneurship or job creation, and you can see that in every, uh, almost in every educational uh, sector in higher institution uh, institutes of learning, you see that entrepreneurship has been introduced. So now. How can uh, this be taken in another perspective, like uh, putting the, the Russia-Africa uh, ties uh, at, at the fore? So what are the steps to ensure uh, that uh, Russia's investment in Africa is focused towards entrepreneurship and job creation? And of course, rather than just relying solely on uh, aspects like uh, resource uh, exploitation and of course, how can this bolster entrepreneurship in Africa, especially among the vibrant African young population? Uh, you know, I had a meeting today with uh, some Russian business people, and we discussed this issue uh, of developing upcoming small businesses, which is very, very important. You, you know, uh, my biggest worry, uh, especially in South Africa, we find these international companies, when they come to South Africa, they want to be, do business with well-established uh, businesses in South Africa, which is a challenge. And then you find that entrepreneurs, young business people, and, uh, or small business, they are not actually gaining from that uh, investment or from those uh, investments that are coming. I think uh, we lost doctor. We, lo we lost doctor. If you are just uh, tuning in, you are most welcome. This is Views on the Continent on Africa Media, and now uh, we are looking at the, this very important aspect uh, states' foreign policy. How is it encouraging the buoyancy, economic buoyancy of uh, African uh, countries? How is it actually? helping to maintain, very important, the autonomy or sovereignty of African states, and of course, how can these foreign policies help to position Africa in this uh, global con uh, context? We, we see here uh, uh, industrialization that is on the rise. Uh, it, can we get you, doctor, if you're okay, you can ride on. All right, that was still on the same question of entrepreneur. Hello? Hello, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you, Doctor. We were actually analyzing how the partnership between Russia and Africa and how Russia's foreign policy through foreign investment in other aspects can help to bolster entrepreneurial drive among the very vibrant African youth so that we can actually mitigate uh, the, uh, mitigate, uh, mit the, the dying of young people trying to cross over the Mediterranean in search for green pasture. I think what we need to do is to encourage any uh, investors or any foreign companies that when they come to Africa, they must try and make sure that they they form partnership with small business, especially with the youth. Uh, 
Uh, because the biggest challenge, uh, especially what I've seen in my country, South Africa, is that these foreign companies, when they come, they, want, they are looking actually for well-established business, uh, people who are already in business. They don't want to develop a small business and then grow with them. So we need to encourage uh, foreign investors uh, in this place, uh, Russian investors, that when they come to Africa to invest, they must look for small business and grow with them. You know, if you grow with small business, uh, you are transferring skills. Another thing that we are doing, job creation, and we are encouraging youth uh, to be business-minded. Because remember, the the challenge also of Africa is a lot of youth are unemployed, uh, but they are looking for business. So what we need to do is to encourage uh, the Russian business people that they must actually, when they come to Africa, look for small business, develop with them, and then grow the youth in business so, so that we develop entrepreneurs, future entrepreneurs, because the future of uh, Africa actually lies with our youth. So if we forget them when we have any business opportunities, then it, uh, we are leaving behind the future of Africa. So what we are trying to do here is also to encourage uh, Russian business people to make sure that when they go to Africa, uh, they must make sure that they are partners of small business youth business, then with the ads. Thank you for that, uh, Dr. Mbli. Uh, coming back to you, Russia, uh, Yulia, beg your pardon. So uh, some, some people or some pundits argue that uh, Russia's military and security uh, partnerships in Africa have actually affected or influenced economic decision-making in uh, recipients' uh, uh, countries or nations. Now the question is, how can these uh, actually uh, uh, be effectively managed potential uh, risk be effectively managed to ensure economic development remains a priority if actually uh, the uh, uh, the statement is uh, uh, tr uh, true to fact? Um, well, you see, um, I think that uh, one of the uh, uh, strongest, uh, one of the strongest areas uh, uh, in which uh, Russia can, uh, you know, provide some uh, uh, some solutions is definitely uh, security. So Russia is good at uh, uh, very basic uh, infrastructure, you know, very basic issues such as, uh, you know, um, again, um, energy, water supply systems, uh, agriculture security so this is something that uh, russia is um, experienced in and uh, there is the uh, practical um, set of practical solutions for this kind of things and there is the uh, background that allows to talk about it what russia is not good at is packaging um you know uh, promotion this kind of things uh, this is definitely not one of the uh, strengths uh, but when we talk about the very basics, uh, security included, uh, un well, fortunately or unfortunately, Russia has had a very uh, uh, complicated past, uh, but a past that has uh, taught us a lot, right? So in terms of uh, providing security and maintaining stability, um, including the, uh, uh, let's say, um, not an easy environment of uh, multinational, multicultural community societies with uh, uh, different um, types of issues uh, coming about, uh, that is the experience that we've had, uh, uh, including the uh, uh, the previous three or four um, decades, and uh, this is something that we can um, sort of uh, export, and this is how we can uh, already talk about, um, you know, the uh, the good experience and the best practice practices we have, and this is something that can help others avoid those mistakes. We have seen uh, the activities of Russian uh, security uh, specialists um, in some of the African countries that have also proven their effectiveness and uh, that have proven that even a very limited amount of uh, uh, people uh, focused on uh, collaborating with the uh, constructive forces and uh, being focused on um, you know, implementation of the approaches that they have been using in uh, other regions, including Russia, that this can actually change the situation in quite a limited period of time, just in a time span of several years. 
so much. Uh, uh, one last question as we are actually uh, rounding up. Uh, we want to look at Africa's uh, renewable energy uh, potential, which, uh, which actually remains untapped. Now, how can uh, Russia's expertise and investment contributor to the development of clean energy projects, and how uh, might this project uh, and how uh, can this project uh, enhance the economic growth of African states? To you, Yulia. Um, well, um, I'll uh, try to keep it brief. Uh, and uh, you know, the conclusions that I would share uh, uh, would be um, yes, uh, very brief, but based on years and years of uh, various scientific studies and again practical experience. So. Uh, when you talk about sustainable, uh, when you talk about sustainable solutions, uh, the uh, cleanest one and the most effective one to ensure um, quite a big demand of production is nuclear. Um, and there are already solutions that allow to use nuclear waste to reuse uh, the nuclear waste, uh, thus eliminating the problem of uh, uh, nuclear waste uh, being buried underground, right? So uh, when you talk about renewables that use wind and sun energy, at this point in time, the modern technology allows to use them effectively for the needs of local communities or, um, you know, a limited amount of households, or in order to use them in some kind of remote areas where you don't have uh, alternative sources. Uh, in case if you have um, enough of uh, water, uh, hydro uh, power plants uh, can also be an option, right? Um, yet at the same time, uh, you know, from what we see, even the German experience, and Germany is quite good at uh, technology, it shows that uh, alternative uh, energy sources based on solar and uh, wind energy, they're not enough to ensure stable, um, uh, uh, to ensure the needs of production in a stable way. So is something that has to be considered and again one of the uh, most effective solutions that can ensure um, uh, you know the needs of production not just for one country maybe but for uh, the needs of a region is uh, nuclear and uh, um, at, at the moment you will not find any better options uh, on the globe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, coming to you uh... Dr. Anduli, for the uh, one last question before we culminate uh, this program, we've been talking about uh, foreign policy of countries uh, engaging in Africa and how these uh, uh, policies can be geared towards uh, ensuring economic buoyancy development of African uh, states. Of course, now let's look at uh, how ready uh, uh, African stakeholders, African governments are to actually engage fully uh, with uh, the uh, uh, Russian Federation in your analysis earlier on you made mention, even Yulia made mentioned uh, of a fake news which has been circulating and of course how we see uh, some parties uh, uh, telling African countries, some African countries not to engage uh, uh, with uh, Russia. But now uh, when, when it comes to decisions, it's supposed to be uh, sovereign states making decisions which actually uh, can help uh, uh, meet their uh, 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 objectives as a nation. So in your own perspective, now that the Russia-Africa summit is going on, what can African stakeholders do? We're talking here, including the political will, because no matter what we say, what we do, if uh, there is the lack of political will, we'll see that things will continue to move subtly, and of course, it will continue to lead to disgruntlement among uh, African population, and uh, that will uh, uh, amount again to the instability that we are seeing across the African continent. But now, engaging economically, there is need to see the practicality. So now, on the African perspective, how can our leaders ensure this strong political will that will help uh, open doors of uh, uh, cooperation, especially economic cooperation, while respecting the sovereignty of African states, all for the good of African countries in the contemporary and controversial society? 
Uh, I must say that uh, I think the political will is there among African uh, countries to do business with Russia. Um, the presence of uh, a lot of uh, African heads of state and ministers and business people from Africa, it shows that it definitely there is a political will uh, to do business uh, with uh, Russia. I think what we need to do uh, is to make sure that we don't listen to negative foreign policies that are, are coming out, discouraging African states not to do any business or sporting relationship with, with Russia. That's the first step which we, we need to do, uh, is to remind all these countries that are putting pressure on us that we are independent countries of Africa. We have a right to do business with USA, we have a right to business with England or Russia. So the independence of Africa must be respected. That's the first step. And what is very important, the role of the media. You know, since this conflict here between Russia and Ukraine, I'm really discouraged by the role of the media in this because, firstly, they are not giving us the true story of what's happening on the ground and the reason why the war started. And they are aware what was started, but they are not going to give you the, those reasons. They are aware what's happening. And now we're getting a lot of fake news around this war. So what we need to do, first step also, is to make sure that we are aware that there are a lot of fake news that are being used to influence uh, independent countries with the negative foreign policies. So those are two things which we need to do, do uh, moving forward, is to have a political willingness to do business with Russia, which uh, first day of the summit, I think we have seen it's been uh, wonderful, and tomorrow we are continuing. Uh, it shows that there is a political willingness. And also our foreign policies, we must guard against uh, foreign negative foreign policies that are saying don't do business with Russia. And also, uh, thirdly, the media, we must be very careful of the media. I'm really discouraged about the media. Actually, the media is not uh, bringing, trying to bring peace between Russia and Ukraine. They are actually fueling that the war must continue, which is a, a, a big challenge. So let's uh, be careful. I think uh, let's have a positive media like African media, which is uh, publishing the truth about uh, Russia and about Africa. So let's move forward on those directions. Thank you for the great uh, insight, uh, uh, Dr. Mbuli, uh, regarding our topic for discussion. It was a nice time having you, especially for the first time uh, on the Pan-African television, and hope to have you subsequently in our programs. Uh, of course, uh, I wish uh, you well as you continue to engage uh, with businesses, stakeholders, in the auspices or under the auspices of the uh, Russia-Africa Summit. Also, I appreciate uh, Yulia Burke for her contribution uh, so far as we continue to uh, discuss uh, this very pertinent uh, topic, which is very compelling in present uh, uh, global context, uh, looking at the place of the foreign policies and how these foreign policies can actually uh, help uh, the African continent to fast track, to redefine her uh, economic trajectory. Thank you. It was a great insight from you, dear Ilya. Thank you, yes, and um, I'm very happy once again to say that uh, this one time uh, we're all here at the very same uh, venue, able to exchange opinions uh, in a fast and effective way, uh, uh, able to uh, come to join solutions, and uh, we hope to continue this way even um, in the uh, complicated circumstances of the global transformation that is happening all over the place so much uh, there is need to bring that change a change that is positive so that together uh, we can make a well a better place for humanity you know the united nations itself underlined that the, the nation the world needs to be safe for unite for humanity and when we engage in such 
constructive discussions, we go a long way to solve the problems affecting the world and of course making it a better place for humanity. We apologize uh, for all the technical upheavers and of course uh, Anna uh, couldn't join because of uh, uh, the uh, technical issues and of course uh, another panelist who had to join us uh, in the person of uh, our Don Melo, who is BRICS representative for Western Central Africa. Uh, that couldn't make it for obvious reasons, but then it was still a compelling and constructive uh, discussion full of uh, insight. I think it will go a long way uh, to create great impact and of course, change the perspectives, especially the negative perspective uh, that surrounds the relationship between Russia and Africa. It was a nice time. I will not go without acknowledging also the uh, technical crew for ensuring uh, that in spite of the challenges, the program was a success. But to you all, televiewers, keep trusting Africa Media and remember, news is always on the move on Africa Media. Do have a splendid moment as you continue to watch our programs. Bye-bye. Afrique Média, le monde, c'est nous.